order. It's time for questions to the Minister of Enterprise, Trade and Investment, and we will start with listed questions. And I call Mr. Fra McCann. Mr. McCann. Gormila Malgat, Prilas Kankulia. Kest have a hand. Question number one. Postal services are reserved to Westminster under paragraph 7 of Schedule 3 of the Northern Ireland Act 1998 and are not therefore the responsibility of my department. The Consumer Council for Northern Ireland is funded by the Department for Business, Innovation and Skills to represent consumers and postal issues in Northern Ireland. I call Mr McCann for supplementary. Thank you. I thank the Minister for her answer. Does she not accept or does she accept that the unacceptably high cost of posting items across the border presents an unwarranted and unwanted tax on cross-border economic development? This is a matter that has been taken up by the Consumer Council, and as I understand it, they're carrying out uh, a piece of work uh, in uh, the context of the fact that they have been given these powers by the Department for Business, Innovation and Skills. Of course, they'll respond uh, to their sponsor department when they've carried out that piece of work, but I've no doubt they'll also share it with me and indeed uh, with the committee. Mr Gordon Dunn. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for her answers today. Can the Minister clarify the new role that the Consumer Council have in relation to postal services in Northern Ireland? Well, I've indicated that they now have, uh, since the 1st of April of this year, um, responsibility for consumer representation for postal services in Northern Ireland. Uh, before that, uh, Consumer Futures were responsible, uh, but they have now um, taken on this role, the Consumer Council for Northern Ireland. And uh, as it is a reserved matter, the Department for Business, Innovation and Skills uh, are providing funding uh, of £255,000 to the Consumer Council uh, for 2014-15 uh, to undertake the consumer representation role in respect of postal services in Northern Ireland. And as I understand it, their work uh, plan for this year broadly covers three main areas. The launch of the Council's uh, new role and responsibilities for postal services, uh, the post office network, a very important uh, part of rural life in Northern Ireland, and mail and parcels. Thank you. And I call Mr David McNary. Question two. Whilst I do not have details of English visitors, there were almost 1.2 million visitors from Great Britain in 2013, uh, an increase of 13% on 2012. Uh, Great British visitors uh, make up 56% of our total external visitors, uh, and it is therefore a very important market for us. Uh, Tourism Ireland has been highlighting visitor experiences which appeal to families such as Titanic Belfast, uh, the Giants Causeway, Causeway Coastal Route, as well as our unique National Trust properties. It is using a variety of marketing tools to get its message through to GB families, including advertising on television, radio, outdoors and in cinemas, in national and regional newspapers and lifestyle magazines. It is important uh, that Tourism Ireland, uh, in my opinion, increases its activity, uh, including in England, for us to see further growth in visitor numbers from Great Britain. I call Mr David McNary for supplementary. Can I thank the Minister for a very comprehensive and, and very useful answer and um, <clears throat> speak well of her in the success that she has had in her own particular office and the contribution she has made to tourism. She <clears throat> had hoped she might have mentioned the ferry services, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I wonder in the light of that could I ask would she consider undertaking a review of the ferry services between England and Northern Ireland? in tandem with the review of how we are attracting that potentially lucrative market in England, which may give her the figures that I've been looking for. Well, in relation to the ferry services, we do undertake uh, cooperative marketing uh, with the airlines, but also with the ferry services, and we work very closely with those ferry services that are here in Larne and in Belfast, um, and I'm quite happy to share those details with the member if those would be useful to him. Mr. William Humphrey. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for answer so far. Can I ask the Minister what will be the impact on the Tourism Ireland budget, given the cutbacks in the Department's overall budget? Well, uh, I've been looking very closely, as you can imagine, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, in relation to the budget uh, overall. Um, as you're aware, we have come to uh, some resolution in relation to the in-year monitoring position. 
Uh, however, for 2015-16, uh, we still have to have a draft budget, and uh, once that happens, I'll have more clarity in relation to that issue. But um, Tourism Ireland uh, will face um, savings and indeed cuts, let's be honest about it, uh, the same as any other part uh, of my department, and uh, that is with regret, but it's something that I have to do right across the department. I call Ms. Joanne Dobson. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I um, thank the Minister for her reply? And I'm sure she'll agree with me that the key to attracting more visitors from England or anywhere else is to promote a positive image of Northern Ireland. Does she agree, in light of disappointing visitor numbers, we need to review current arrangements where Tourism Ireland do not treat us as distinct tourist destination through being marketed in Great Britain? Well, I am aware that there uh, is some unease uh, in relation to the marketing of Northern Ireland in the Great Britain market by Tourism Ireland. It's something uh, that I am looking into and I want to give her an assurance of that uh, over the next uh, coming weeks. I do hope to meet with the uh, Chairman of Tourism Ireland um, to discuss with him uh, some of the uh, claims that have been made to me. Uh, certainly, uh, as regards uh, tourism figures, uh, we had a good year in 2013 in relation uh, to Great Britain uh, visitors. Uh, they were up, and actually, importantly, the spend uh, was up as well, because we don't only have targets in relation to number of visitors. We also have a very stretching target in relation to spend by those visitors that come uh, to Northern Ireland. So it's important that we continue to work uh, with Tourism Ireland, with the Northern Ireland Tourist Board and with other partners to ensure that we get the maximum uh, coverage that we can because our biggest market is GB uh, and therefore we shouldn't forget that. Call Mr Jim Allister. Did the Minister see a recent uh, article, press article by the uh, much respected Kate Hoey on the issue of uh, Tourism Ireland's efforts, if we could call them that, in GB in behalf of Northern Ireland, which was a particularly critical uh, article uh, as to their inactivity uh, and does she agree that unless and until we get the promotion of Northern Ireland within the rest of the United Kingdom into the hands of uh, the Northern Ireland Tourist Board then we're going to continue to be plagued with this problem? Well, as I indicated uh, to Ms Dobson, I am very aware uh, not only of the claims uh, made by uh, Ms Hoey and uh, I do intend to follow up uh, on that article uh, with Ms Hoey to talk to her uh, about those claims, um, but other claims as well. Um, the member will not be surprised to know that um, Tourism Ireland marketing uh, Northern Ireland in Great Britain is not of my choosing. It's something that uh, I inherited from the Belfast Agreement, um, and certainly it's something I think that needs very close scrutiny. So it's something that I will be looking at. Thank you. And I call Mr Trevor Lunn. Yes, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question number three. Invest Northern Ireland offers assistance to new investors to support the creation of new jobs, often over a period of three to five years, sometimes longer. It is the responsibility of the company to create the jobs at a schedule that supports their development and growth. Therefore, Invest NI is not able to meaningfully uh, forecast the likely number of jobs to be created in any year. As at the 31st of March 2014, Invest NI has promoted 9,108 jobs from inward investors since the start of its current corporate plan in 2011. Yeah, Trevor Lund for the supplementary. I beg your pardon. I was catching uh, too many A's at the one time. Uh, thank the Minister for that answer. Uh, I understand that the rules in respect of state assistance are going to change. Uh, so could the Minister comment on what complexities or challenges that might bring about as we go forward? Well, the rules uh, in relation to selective financial assistance have uh, already changed uh, in relation to the amount of funding uh, we can give. Uh, we are still an assisted area uh, within the European Union, but in terms of repeat assistance, we are now curtailed as to how much uh, we can uh, assist those companies and indeed uh, that does curtail us because as a member will know often companies came um, maybe with 20 30 people uh, and then they realized that we really did have a very good offering here and they decided to expand further um, uh, if that is a large company we won't be able to give that selective financial assistance uh, in the future but there are other ways in which we can support uh, the companies we can uh, th with, uh, in conjunction with the Department of Employment and Learning look at 
skills and, and training. Uh, we certainly will be looking at how we can work in terms of research and development and innovation to support people, uh, tax credits depending on uh, the sector that we're talking about. So there are other ways in which uh, we can help, but of course, if we were able to have devolved to Northern Ireland uh, corporation tax, we would uh, uh, automatically have a step change in relation to what we could do. Thanks very much, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answer. And in fact, she, she took me the direction that I was going to take the question in anyway. That's in regard to corporation tax. Um, what assessment has been done by her department if uh, and hopefully when corporation tax enabling powers comes to the local executive here? What assessment has been done by her department? as to the impact of a 12.5 per cent corporation tax level in terms of the FDI, the potential for FDI that it could bring uh, in its wake? Certainly there have been a number of studies um, carried out, uh, not least uh, by the Department and indeed by the um, uh, Employment and Learning Department, because of course if we are to have uh, a huge spike in the number of companies that will then be looking to Northern Ireland, then we want to ensure that we have the appropriate skills uh, available to those companies when they come. Um, so the Economic Advisory Group, um, uh, uh, led by Kate Barker, has been doing uh, some work in this area, and uh, it's in the region of 50,000 jobs over uh, a quite relatively short period of time, uh, which we will be able to achieve, uh, all things being equal, and uh, being able to provide the appropriate young people and skills that those companies would need. So there's no doubt it would be a huge boost to uh, the private sector in Northern Ireland, and of course, in terms of rebalancing and rebuilding, that's exactly what we want to do. Mr. Sidney Anderson. I thank the Minister for her responses so far. But Minister, can, can you tell us uh, what jobs uh, have actually arrived through foreign direct investment uh, since the beginning of August? Thank you. Well, we've had a particularly good uh, period. Um, indeed, over this last uh, six months, we've had 1,200 new jobs by just 10 new inward investors, and that's not talking about uh, indigenous companies that have decided to expand or indeed companies that are already here, but these are new inward investors. Um, we have had uh, 1,200 new jobs. Puppet Labs, uh, Baker McKenzie, Proofpoint, uh, Alexander Mann, uh, Converges, all been very good announcements uh, made, Principal Deputy Speaker, for Northern Ireland and indeed right across Northern Ireland. So we're pleased that those new companies uh, continue to look to Northern Ireland uh, for growth and expansion, many of them for the first time into the European area. And I call Mr Phil Flanagan. The Minister may be aware of a recently published report um, carried out by Dell um, looking into the issue of, of labour mobility. And one of the, the challenges that it identified was around the, the lack of employment opportunities in rural areas um, and the move towards jobs um, in Belfast. Can I ask the Minister how she intends to, to reverse this trend um, and ensure that an adequate number of jobs are created in places like Fermanagh and other rural areas, given the programme for government, government equipment to tackle regional imbalance? I'm very pleased to announce a number of job announcements in Fermanagh over this past period of time, most recently in GR White and Sons in Tempo and Webtech uh, in Enniskill just a couple of weeks ago, and I'm hoping to make further announcements in the near future as well. So it is about proactively working uh, with those companies uh, in the region, ensuring that we portray uh, a positive view of the region to make sure that we are attractive uh, to inward investors when they come uh, to look at the area uh, and to have a good product uh, and availability of those people who are willing to be positive about their areas. Uh, so I think all of that shows that we are moving forward, in particular uh, in the South West, and I look forward uh, to working uh, with the member to make sure that uh, Fermanagh and indeed the whole of the South West is promoted in a very positive way. Could I call Claire Sugden? Thank you, Principal, De Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, can I ask the Minister how effective the Enterprise Zone has been in encouraging foreign direct investment in my constituency? Well, the Enterprise Zone has not yet been uh, confirmed by Her Majesty's Treasury uh, in Coleraine. It has been put forward uh, by the Executive to Treasury for designation as an Enterprise Zone, so it's too early to determine its impact uh, in the area. Uh, but I'm sure uh, that those people uh, who have uh, been working for the Enterprise Zone will want to ensure that it's in place as soon as possible. Thank you. And I call Mr Joe Byrne. Deputy Speaker, question number four. 
The working group has prepared a report based on its analysis of the feasibility study, meetings with key rugby union officials and other relevant organisations. The Minister of Culture, Arts and Leisure and I have received copies of the report and are currently considering it. I will wish to ensure value for money and be convinced of the economic benefits for Northern Ireland in agreeing to jointly bid for the tournament in 2023. Then from Mr. Joe Byrne. Thank you, Control Deputy Speaker. I thank the Minister for her answer. Would the Minister accept that, given that rugby is a fantastic field sport played on an all Ireland basis, and given that in Ulster we have Ravenhill, Kingspan, we have Thoman Park in Limerick, we have the Aviva Park in Dublin, and we have the Galway Sports Ground dedicated to rugby, that Ireland is in a position now with the infrastructure to make a real bid for the World Cup? And what can she do with her counterpart in the Republic to try and advance that case with the rugby authorities? Well, I think it's on record that I am a rugby supporter of Ulster and uh, I very much want to see uh, the Rugby World Cup uh, coming to the island of Ireland in 2023. But as I'm sure the member would want me to ensure, Northern Ireland needs to get as much out of this event as we possibly can. Uh, therefore, I will be looking at the report which has been given to me in that context to make sure that we have a number of teams uh, located uh, and based in Northern Ireland for the Rugby World Cup. Uh, we do recognise uh, uh, that there are more stadium um, uh, available uh, in the Republic of Ireland, but that doesn't mean to say that we can't be creative uh, about what we can do in Northern Ireland. And if we are uh, to assist in funding uh, the bid, I certainly want to ensure that we get good value for money. I'll call Mr. Sammy Douglas. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for answers so far? I'm sure the Minister will agree with me that um, Kyle Lafferty from yeah. Tom Lott in County Fermanagh is a great tourist attraction for Northern Ireland. And in relation to tourist attractions for Northern Ireland, could I ask the Minister, in, in, re, in light of recent debate about the Tourist Events Fund, uh, nights like the Culture Night, which I attended recently, which was a fabulous night um, for Belfast, and she, she's also been to the C.S. Lewis Festival in East Belfast, big supporter, East Side Arts, with uh, our, our friend Van Morrison. Um, so could I ask the Minister for a progress report or an update on the Tourist Events Fund, please? I well, thank the member, and um, if Kyle Laverty is listening to this uh, question time, I'm sure he's saying I've been called many things in my time, but never a tourist attraction. Anyway, uh, I congratulate uh, Northern Ireland um, uh, football team uh, in relation to being top of their group. It's a very nice place to be, uh, and we look forward to them continuing to have that success in Greece. Um, I think it's tomorrow, am I right about that? Uh, in relation to the match there. Uh, in relation to the events funding, this, of course, uh, has caused uh, a lot of angst, and I am the first to acknowledge that. Uh, we are facing a, a very difficult financial time uh, right across uh, government, uh, and given the current budgetary climate, and in the knowledge that future years are going to be uh, very difficult, it has been necessary to review uh, the position uh, right across uh, the department. And given the, all of the circumstances, and given that people would ordinarily be applying in for funding at this time. And, you know, I've heard uh, some of the arts groups uh, say that their funding has been cut. Uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, this is an application uh, every year, so there's no guarantee uh, uh, on any year um, that these groups were going to be able to access funding. They had to apply in on every occasion into a competitive uh, process. Uh, at the moment, we don't have uh, an events fund open call for next year, uh, but let's see what happens in relation to the budgetary discussions in relation to 15-16 uh, over the next uh, period of time. I certainly would like to see some sort of an events fund, uh, but we'll have to see if the money is going to be available for it. Call Mr. Leslie Cree. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I would certainly welcome the Rugby World Cup coming to Ireland, both north and south in 2023. Um, does the Minister recognise that with Northern Ireland now having a voice on the working group, that there's an opportunity to emphasise that the Irish rugby team represents both jurisdictions and is not the R Republic of Ireland's rugby team? Uh, and that, that should be reflected in the Irish Rugby Football Union's uh, attention to things like anthems and flags. Well, I concur with the member's uh, view on those matters and it is my hope that Irish Rugby Football Union uh, will acknowledge the contribution 
um, which um, uh, Ulster makes in terms of rugby, because we do make an incredible contribution uh, to the Irish rugby scene, uh, and I hope that that is acknowledged uh, in Dublin. Uh, as it is in, in Ravenhill in the Kingspan Stadium, which I have difficulty getting used to, but I will have to get used to. Um, uh, it is uh, a rugby team for both jurisdictions. Uh, therefore, I was very keen to ensure that we had the proper representation on the working group. I'm satisfied that we do have that now. And once we um, have had a chance to consider the report, uh, the Minister for Culture, Arts and Leisure and myself will come together uh, to decide if we think uh, the current way forward is the best way forward. Thank you. And I call Ms Paula Bradley. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. Question five. Advanced or high-value manufacturing makes a, a major contribution to the success of the Northern Ireland economy. My department encourages and supports businesses that are capable of investing in knowledge-based innovative technologies and developing capabilities that can ensure they remain internationally competitive and successful, supporting jobs and creating wealth in the economy. We have many excellent examples of businesses that are investing in world-class facilities to sustain and build on Northern Ireland's strong international reputation and manufacturing heritage. Examples include Bombardier, uh, Schrader Electronics, Magellan Aerospace and Wright Bus. Paula Bradley for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for her answer. The um, Minister mentioned Bombardier there, and we, Bombardier there, and we know in September they announced significant job losses. Uh, many of those workers live, are my neighbours within my own community in Utnabe. Can the Minister comment on Bombardier, Bombardier and its importance in Northern Ireland? Well, um, I can indeed, and uh, it was on the 10th of September that Bombardier announced that it intended to make up to 90 permanent posts and 300 of the agency employed staff uh, redundant. Uh, a huge blow, uh, it has to be said. Um, the company uh, currently has, uh, and this is something I don't think a lot of people realise, they have six manufacturing sites in Northern Ireland, um, Belfast Airport Road and Airport Road West. Uh, Dunmurray, Newton Ard, Newton Abbey and Monkstown. Um, it has a current workforce of around 6,300 uh, people, uh, the biggest private sector employer uh, in Northern Ireland, uh, and it is planned that the redundancies will be implemented uh, by the end of the year. And despite the impending job losses, um, it does remain encouraging to note that in the past four years, Bombardier has increased the total workforce by over 1,200 people uh, in Northern Ireland. So whilst I accept uh, uh, it is very regrettable that the announcement has been made in relation to the restructuring of Bombardier uh, uh, globally, uh, Bombardier does have a very strong uh, presence on, uh, in Belfast and continues to play uh, a major role. Uh, in all, virtually all of the aircraft programs uh, right across the world. So I think that's part of its strength. Its diversity is part of its strength. I call Ms. Sandra Overland. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker. I wonder, uh, has the Minister made any assessment as to how those changes in Bombardier will affect other uh, industries across, Nor or not other industries, sorry, other businesses across Northern Ireland who support Bombardier in that <coughs> aerospace industry? And the member is absolutely right to reference the supply chain uh, into Bombardier because uh, Bombardier have direct employees of 6,300, um, but they have many, many other hundreds of people that are reliant uh, on Bombardier in Belfast. Uh, we have a very strong uh, working relationship with Bombardier, Invest Northern Ireland, uh, uh, have a client executive embedded uh, with Bombardier, so any changes in relation to Bombardier are fed directly into the system, and we will work with any companies uh, that have difficulties. I think there's around 80 companies that rely um, particularly in precision engineering. Uh, that's not taking into account the services that are provided into Bombardier. These are just um, supply chain people. So yes, um, any time there is a reduction in manpower in Bombardier, we do look at uh, a wider picture into the supply chain. And I call Mr. Sidney Anderson. Question six, Principal Deputy Speaker. A new British-Irish visa scheme was launched by the Secretary of State for the Home Office, Theresa May MP, in conjunction with the Republic of Ireland's Minister for Justice and Equality, Francis Fitzgerald TD, on the 6th of October. This positive development was an action in the G8 
Economic Pact and enables for the first time Chinese and Indian visitors to come to Northern Ireland through the Irish Republic on an Irish visa as well as through Great Britain on a UK visa. This is very welcome news uh, and Tourism Ireland and Visit Britain will be working very hard to promote the scheme. I call Mr Anderson for a supplementary. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for that response. And certainly it is welcome news. But, uh, Minister, uh, can you give an update on uh, what assistance your department is giving to the international airport to help encourage uh, the introduction of new routes? Well, as the member will be aware, the uh, direct uh, connectivity into Northern Ireland is one of the priorities in terms of how we grow our tourism numbers, and I'm very much committed to increasing Northern Ireland's air connectivity. Uh, I have met uh, and continue to meet uh, Northern Ireland airports, and indeed I just recently met the new managing director uh, of the international airport, Graeme Keddy, um, regarding their route development plans, uh, and my officials uh, are also in regular dialogue with our airports. And indeed, last month uh, we took a Northern Ireland stand at the World Routes Conference uh, in Chicago. So we are out there, we're looking for new routes, we're trying to be innovative in how we attract those new routes uh, to the international airport and indeed routes to the other airports as well. Uh, but in terms of international connectivity, it's very much at the top of my agenda. I call Ms Dolores Kelly. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. I wonder, Minister, would you join with me in, in welcoming the, the establishment of the new uh, Council for the Republic of China in Belfast and, and uh, uh, also that the availability and accessibility for visa for travel will be much enhanced uh, for visitors b uh, both way and indeed for the students at our universities. Well, absolutely. I was unaware that we had a newly appointed consul, so I look forward uh, to meeting him or her uh, in the near future uh, to talk about this because uh, we know that those uh, people from China who travel far afield, uh, are, they stay for longer uh, and they spend a lot of money. <laughs> so therefore, we want to encourage them to come to Northern Ireland. In the past, uh, there was confusion in relation to if they had an Irish visa, could they come to Northern Ireland? Uh, what would happen if something happened, they had a, an accident or whatever, and they were in Northern Ireland. So I think this clarity is a very strong piece uh, for Tourism Ireland to take forward. Uh, and as I say, uh, if the member has uh, some knowledge of the Council, I would very much look forward to meeting them. I call Mr Danny Kinahan. Thank you very much, Principal Deputy Speaker. I thank the Minister for her answer so far. But have um, studies been done to ensure that from these visa changes that we are going to benefit here in the north, in our airports especially, the Belfast International and the City Airport? to ensure that we lure people here rather than always coming via Dublin? I think it's probably a mixture of both, if you don't mind me saying. So until we get the increased connectivity, I mean, nobody's suggesting at the moment that we sh will be getting a direct flight from China into the international airport. Um, so therefore, we do need to work uh, principally uh, with Visit Britain to ensure that we get people to come across, that they understand <coughs> that the visa that they have for the UK covers Northern Ireland, or if they're coming in through uh, Dublin, that they understand that they can come up to Northern Ireland. Um, and I think that that's the work which Tourism Ireland has to take forward because, as I say, the Chinese visitors uh, are very important visitors. We want to welcome more of them uh, and hope that they do visit Northern Ireland on their itinerary. Thank you. And I call Mr Alban McGuinness. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Number seven. Following the successful implementation of the new tax incentives under the Creative Industry Tax Reliefs, the local film and TV industry can benefit from a group of corporation tax reliefs. These include the film tax relief introduced in 2007, the high-end television tax relief and the animation tax relief introduced in April 2013, and the video game tax relief introduced from the 1st of April of this year. My department, working closely with Northern Ireland Screen and Invest Northern Ireland, was instrumental in securing these new credits, and I believe the impetus now exists for a truly export-focused screen industry for Northern Ireland. Well, Mr McGuinness for a supplementary. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, and could I thank the Minister for her comprehensive reply. Clearly, this is an area for future uh, development, massive potential. Is there any way in which the industry here could benefit from cooperation uh, with counterparts uh, in the Irish Republic? Because I do think in the field of creativity that we have to use all the talents and skills that abound within the island of Ireland. 
thank the member for supplementary. Indeed, we will want to work with all um, countries, wherever uh, the people are, so that we can uh, increase uh, our output. Uh, as a member will know, I have increased the budget for Screen NI substantially so that they can take advantage of, of what is there at the moment. I had a very useful meeting uh, with the Director General of the BBC just last week uh, when he was over in Northern Ireland to try and encourage him to do more uh, in relation to national output uh, so that we can uh, see more Northern Ireland uh, productions uh, right across the network because I think that's very important too. And indeed, some of um, uh, colleagues from the Republic of Ireland are investing in Northern Ireland. I'm thinking particularly of Jam Media down um, uh, in Murray's Exchange in Sandy Row, where they came to do some work there uh, to take advantage, perhaps, uh, of the very good tax relief schemes that we now have in place for making productions. Thank you. And that brings us to the end of the period for listed questions. And we now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions. And Ms. Katrina Ruyan is not in her place, so I call Mr. David Hildridge. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Is the Minister aware that the impact of the, proposed, or the recent proposed job losses at JTI will impact much further afield uh, than the immediate Ballymena area? I'm very aware of workers in my own constituency with BT 38, 39, and 40 postcodes of Newton Abbey, Carrigan, and Larne. Well, I do recognise that that is the case, and actually one of those interviewed on BBC Radio Ulster on the day of the announcement was from Carrick Fergus, as I recall, um, and he was very clearly uh, saying that this is not just uh, an issue for Balamina, it's an issue for further afield, and the travel to work distance means that there will be quite a lot of people impacted in, in, in a, a, a circle, if you like, right across uh, the northeast uh, of Northern Ireland. So I do understand that that is the case. I further understand, uh, talking about supply chains earlier on in the substantive questions, uh, that there are many companies uh, that rely on JTI Gallagher's uh, for uh, their businesses, and those companies will also be impacted. So I've asked Invest Northern Ireland uh, to do some work in and around that to ensure that we know which companies are going to be impacted by the closure of JTI. Mr. Hildage for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Principal. Deputy Speaker, I do thank the Minister for her answer. And will the Minister, along with the Dell Minister, do everything to ensure that the skills at JTA are not lost to the Northern Ireland economy? Well, absolutely. And uh, the Member will be aware, and the House will be aware, that the uh, Employment and Learning Minister and myself have been asked uh, by the Executive to engage uh, with JTI. Uh, we did hope that we would be able to go up early this week. However, the company, and we have to respect. Um, their processes, uh, have uh, others to uh, consult with before they speak uh, with us, uh, and therefore it will be later on in the week, but certainly we will be going up to Ballymena. Um, I think we very much need to engage in a skills audit as the first piece that we need to engage in and see what it is that we can do uh, to help those uh, affected. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. The Minister recently announced the complete cessation of the Tourism Events Fund for 2015-16, which threatens around 65 organisations across Northern Ireland, contributing to important events and festivals, doing much for our tourism society and our economy. Can I ask the Minister, therefore, how she can justify the 100 per cent cut to this fund? It's not a question of justifying a 100% cut to the fund. I wanted to give clarity uh, to people in uh, the sector uh, that we were in a position where we could not uh, find the funding to give an events fund for 15-16. If that changes in the near future, and I very much hope that it does, uh, then we will put out a call. But this is the time of the year when applications would ordinarily be forthcoming, and therefore I wanted to give them clarity in relation to the issue. Mr. Little for a supplement. Thank the Minister for her response, but she will be aware that this threatens organisations, festivals and events that uh, for every uh, one pound funding they receive return three pounds for our local economy. Can I ask the Minister to reassure those organisations that she does indeed value uh, and understand the importance of this work to our society and economy and say what specific work she's undertaking uh, to ensure a reinstatement of the fund? Well, the budget discussions will be ongoing from now to the end of October, uh, and if I can uh, count on the support of my colleagues uh, to put in place uh, as a priority the reinstatement of the events funding, uh, then the events funding will be reinstated. Uh, but this is about priorities. It is about making sure 
um, that we have the right priorities in place. I will be put forwarding uh, the priorities uh, for my department. And you know, I've heard um, some people say that the uh, international funds uh, basically should be robbed uh, to try and assist uh, the events funding. First, the first thing to say about that is the international funds have a letter of offer. They have contractual commitments. Uh, and I'm not in the business of breaking contractual commitments. Second thing to say in relation to sponsorships. Second thing to say in relation to sponsorship on an annual basis is the fact that people apply every year. They apply into this fund. There's no guarantee of receiving funding every year. Everybody has to apply every year and be assessed alongside all of the other applications that come in. So it is a competitive process. And whilst people may say that their funds have been cut, they don't have any funds any year until they apply into the funds. Order. And I call Mr. Loris Kelly. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Minister, you may be aware over the last day or so of reports of a slowdown in the uh, recovery uh, of the economy. I wondered, Minister, given the uh, threat of cuts, what reprofiling that you are doing within your department to actually assist uh, businesses during uh, this time of uncertainty? Well, uh, I read the uh, Ulster Bank uh, monitoring um, paper uh, just this morning actually I was coming up in the car and they have said uh, for the 15th month in a row uh, we're facing into growth so I'm not sure where the member uh, is, uh, have, is obtaining her information from I, I can't say that um, uh, Richard Ramsey is uh, ordinarily the person that gives good news but he continues to give good news from the Ulster Bank and therefore I can only take it as an objective analysis uh, we have, uh, just for the record, uh, and I think it's important to say this, um, the number of people claiming unemployment benefits has fallen by 12,600 people over this last 20 months. I think that's a very good news story, uh, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. And as well as that, uh, for the ninth consecutive uh, month, we've had a rise uh, in the number of jobs being created. So, there is good news out there, and sometimes I wish people would try and give confidence, because that is the important thing to give uh, to our economy, confidence so that people will spend and that people will go forward and create more new jobs. Ms Kelly, for a supplement. I can assure the uh, Minister I didn't pluck it out of the air and there was an acknowledgement uh, in the articles that I've read uh, that uh, there have be, has been recent growth, but uh, I, this is in the backdrop of uh, public sector cuts of the redundancy schemes that are being discussed and a fact, the fact that we are still by and large a low-wage economy. So the question was merely how is, how is the Minister reprofiling in light of the cuts that are threatening her department and others, the programme of work for the next six months and the, year and the next financial year? Nobody can say, uh, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, that I have not been creating jobs in this uh, economy over this last period of time. And, you know, we had an executive meeting on Thursday night to agree uh, a loan from Her Majesty's Government to try and get us out of difficulties so we could bring some sort of stability to the economy here in Northern Ireland and avert crisis. And the SCLP did not support uh, that loan. Yeah. And the SCLP felt it better that we should go, in, better that we should go into crisis uh, rather than to try and get stability uh, into the Northern Ireland economy. Certainly I would rather have stability in the Northern Ireland economy than crisis at any time. You and I call Mr. Peter Weir. And if, I can, question. if I can ask the, uh, the Minister what level of difficulty she believes uh, that, particularly for large companies in Northern Ireland, the high energy costs are causing at the moment? Well, this is a, a real issue and one that I know um, members from North Antrim are particularly concerned about given uh, the news from Gallagher's over this past week. Uh, I have been working with the utility regulator to do some work in relation to energy costs. There's a very net area which I can look at. I can't look at wholesale costs. Uh, I can't look at a whole range of issues. But the, the area where I can look at with the utility regulator, we are looking at at present and I hope to be able to say something around that in the very near future. Yeah. Mr. Weir for Minister for her response, and obviously the issue of Gallagher's was something we'll be coming back to in the, the urgent oral. But can I ask her what level of contributory factor the energy costs had in terms of the Gallagher's decision? In addition to the Gallagher's decision, that was more in and around uh, two huge issues. First, the illegal trade uh, in relation to tobacco items, and secondly, the implementation of the European Directive, which has had a huge impact. And I will return to it 
uh, during the urgent oral because I think it's important that members not in this House uh, and the wider community outside of this House understand the reason why uh, Gallagher and JTI have taken this decision. Of course, it's up to us to try and work through the consultation process to see if there's anything we can do about that decision, but certainly those were the two big impacts. Mr. Sammy Wilson. Thank you, Mr. President, Deputy Speaker. Uh, many people in East Antrim welcomed the Minister's news that she was going to spend £15 million on improving uh, access to fibre uh, broadband networks uh, across East Antrim because it's one of the worst areas. Can she tell us when she's expecting the, re the report from BT uh, indicating where exactly that £15 million worth of investment is going to be? Well, in relation to that fund, uh, we've already received indications that it will be in eight phases. Uh, and I'm, I don't have the figures in front of me when East Antrim comes online, but I'm very happy to share those with uh, the member. He is right to say that we have invested hugely uh, in relation to telecoms interventions over this past period of time. We continue to do so, but as he will recognise himself, it becomes more and more difficult to get to those at the, at the edge, if you like, uh, that need help with their broadband. Wilson for supplementary. I accept that it is difficult, especially once you get into rural areas, but I trust that the investment will take place. But is the Minister aware that there are eight industrial estates across Northern Ireland, two of them in East Antrim, which currently don't have access to fibre uh, optic broadband, and yet those are not even being considered in this BT review? Does she think that in light of the industrial policy which she has, that that's a wise decision? Well, in relation to BT, as a member knows, I can only cajole and try and influence BT on what they do in terms of their commercial applications. Uh, but in terms of industrial parks, he is right to raise that issue because if we are to look at new ways of having uh, inward investors look at um, industrial parks, then we must have a very good offering for them to look at. And that includes having connectivity and having that broadband accessibility. So it is something that I am looking at at present with Invest Northern Ireland to see if there are any interventions which we can take. Thank you, Ms. Michelle, Michael v. Mr. Speaker, um, the Minister will be aware of the challenges currently facing the Ulster Orchestra and the substantial contribution that the Orchestra makes to Northern Ireland. Could I ask the Minister if she could comment on the current difficulties? And uh, like uh, the member, I had the great pleasure of listening to the Ulster Orchestra last uh, <coughs> Wednesday evening at the BBC uh, concert, and they really do make a substantial um, uh, investment in Northern Ireland in terms of their uh, cultural grasp, and it's a, it's a wide range of activities that they engage in. And actually, when I was looking at, at JTI Gallagher, uh, it did not uh, miss me that uh, JTI Gallagher have been uh, their principal corporate sponsor uh, over this past period of time. So not only are they facing uh, difficulties in terms of their government uh, funding, but they're also uh, unfortunately now facing difficulties in relation to their corporate funding. I am a great supporter of the Ulster Orchestra and I very much want to see it survive. Michael Veen for supplement. Thank you and, and I welcome the Minister's comments. And I'm, I'm aware that the funding of the Ulster Orchestra falls outside Deddy's remit, but the Minister will agree is she, that the brand of the Ulster Orchestra is important to the marketing of Northern Ireland. Would the Minister be in a position to give any assistance um, to the orchestra at this stage or in, in the absence of any help coming from DECAL? Well, I'm certainly happy to work collaboratively uh, with the member and with uh, DECAL in looking at some imaginative ways to help, uh, but the principal funding, as she will understand, will still have to reside uh, with the Department of Culture, Arts and Leisure, and I hope that the Minister um, does realise the importance of the Ulster Orchestra to Northern Ireland. And, uh, I may not have time for supplementary, but could I call Mr Joe Byrne? Yeah. Thanks, Mr Principal, Deputy Speaker. Can the Minister state uh, what progress has been made in trying to attract inward investment to the North West, in particular Straban, which has suffered largely from so much unemployment over the years, and the Derry City, given that there is great concern about trying to have balanced regional development across Northern Ireland? Uh, and there is, and uh, Convergis, as they uh, will know, have uh, announced 333 uh, new jobs for Londonderry. I was very pleased to be at that announcement. We're also engaging with others who are currently assessing uh, the city and the region uh, for uh, new inward investment, and I hope uh, that there's a good positive message coming forward from all of the representatives in that area to ensure that we can land that proposition and not blow it away by negativity. 
Okay, and I'll call Joe Vern quickly for a supplement. Yes, I, th I thank the Minister for her answer. Would the Minister accept that it's very important that Invest Northern Ireland gives every encouragement to any would-be investor who may be attracted towards Straban or Derry, and that all the support necessary, financial and backup, is vital in relation to a potential jobs creation project? I could give a very short answer and say yes, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, but I will also say that Invest Northern Ireland does offer uh, very attractive uh, figures uh, for those people wanting to invest outside of Belfast. And if he looks at the figures that we've offered to some of the inward investors, he will see that. Thank you. And that uh, time is up. Thank you, Minister. Uh, 